Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Um, practical application of hydrogeochemistry and mineral exploration. Uh, I guess this talk draws on some of my experience in the, the R&D world and, and also uh, applying these, these kind of techniques commercially. Uh, I thought I'd start with a couple of key messages in hydrogeochemistry um, because I realise that I stand between you guys and morning tea, so I'll try and keep to time and uh, keep this relatively short. Consider hydrogeochemistry beyond the R&D realm. Um, it, it's no longer just an R&D uh, kind of project. It's, it's exploration ready now. It's, it's something that uh, large explorers can apply, small explorers can apply. Has application on, on many different projects, uh, precious metals, base metals, uranium, uh, geothermal resources, um, even diamond exploration looking for, for kimberlites. Getting your sample preparation and uh, correct and avoiding contamination are really essential. Um, with hydrogeochem samples, we're dealing with um, much lower concentrations than you typically face with soils, stream sediments, rocks. As a consequence, contamination can be a real issue. Groundwaters and hydro samples um, can provide a bulk or integrated signal with some ability to deal with cover. Um, it, they offer a potential way of, of, of dealing with um, you know, relatively thick covered sequences. Um, simple interpretations of your data can be very effective. However, um, often they can only get you so far and you get deeper insight from more specialised data interpretation. And if you, if you have trouble with that, um, help's available. Why groundwater? Well, groundwaters are a mobile sample medium. Um, they can offer a, a 3D advantage over uh, traditional surface uh, samples and some ability to see through, through cover. Uh, they can work to integrate the geochemistry from a large body of rock and so in many ways you can consider groundwater sampling or hydro samples as a, a subsurface stream sediment sample. Um, they can be a really good option for screening large areas um, in regional exploration programs, um, but that is really dependent on the availability of a, a reasonable network of potential sample sites. You, you can't get, get samples from anywhere you want. Um, it also has application at, at much smaller, sc small, smaller scales on, on the mine scale. And as I said before, it's matured well beyond um, simple R&D projects and it's, it is within the reach of, of explorers. Um, this next image here is just a, a simple schematic of, of groundwater hydrogeology where we might have a, uh, or hopefully a concealed um, uh, mineralisation somewhere. Um, there are mechanisms of, of getting, getting water up into the, the relatively near surface environment where it might be picked up in, in stock bores, um, wells, and also in, in lakes, um, recharge at the bottom of rivers. Even if we have got an aquitard through here, uh, we might have some kind of structural disruption here which allows transmission of water from, from depth into the, uh, the environment closer to the surface where we've got a, a better chance of picking it up. Just a couple of images of, of where I've um, been involved in the application of, of hydrogeochemistry across the world. Um, the Arctic tundra uh, out on a salt lake in um, uh, Western Australia here. This is on Lake Carey where we were collecting uh, water just offshore from Sunrise Dam around about 100, 140 metres to the, the, the base of cover there and this, this sample was airlifted in an air core rig. Uh, I forgot to point out we were using a helicopter to, to help us sample uh, lake water samples in, in the Arctic here and here's a, a back view um, at, uh, at lower latitudes in, in Canada on a big uh, lake water sampling project. Um, I've also applied it in um, arid, arid regions of the Middle East, uh, looking at springs and, um, and domestic water supply wells. There's uh, a multitude of, of opportunities to collect your groundwater sample. Where to sample, as I, as I was just saying, existing stock and domestic water supply bores. Uh, you can retask old exploration drill holes. You can look at lakes. Um, for hydrogeochemistry, I, I probably wouldn't recommend going out there and specifically drilling holes to, to collect groundwater samples from. Um, my experience in at least the mineral exploration application of, of hydrogeochemistry has shown that, that pump purging of bores, if you can do it, it's, it's fine, but uh, uh, I wouldn't specifically go out to unequip bores and, and, and purge them. Um, it hasn't been shown to have a really big exploration benefit. Um, you could collect your samples with various pumps if it's equipped with a windmill, submersible pump, that kind of thing. Um, I like to use a, a flow-through tube sampler or a baler for, um, for drill holes or, or wells which aren't equipped. 
you really need to be mindful and, and watch for potential contaminants. And the CSIRO have, have done some great work in, in investigating options for identifying contamination in groundwater samples, um, estimating it, and providing a, a potential field for which you could um, potentially level your data against. The sampling process itself is, is not particularly difficult. However, it does help if you've got some previous experience in, um, in actually collecting groundwater samples. As I said, it's relatively easy to do, but it's also um, quite easy to mess up. We're dealing with very low um, concentrations and they're, they're very, very sensitive to contamination. Um, a lot of your gold is, is me measured in, in parts per trillion type levels. And so um, you need to adopt established procedures and, and really be consistent with them. In terms of established procedures, the, uh, the CSIRO have published a, a great little flow chart here which um, shows what to do at each, each site. Um, there's other text to sort of accompany this, but at e each site we typically collect, uh, collect around about four, four samples. We follow a, a specialised path for gold pre-concentration to allow us to get um, PPT um, concentration levels for gold. Uh, we follow another path here involving filtration and acidification of samples for, for metals, uh, a different path for anions, another path for an alkalinity determination to get our bicarbonate. We take a couple of in-field measurements for things like pH, EH, so redox potential, electrical conductivity, and some workers also look at reduced iron. These are things which um, may change, they're, they're not particularly stable and they may change from where you've collected your sample at depth and, and returned it to the laboratory. Um, sample preparation is, a, a, it's about preserving your sample and stabilising it so that you can get it off to the lab for analysis. Field determinations, uh, as I was just saying, um, parameters that are unstable and are likely to change between the field collection site and the lab, um, or things which might be of use to you in the field, like electrical conductivity or, or salinity, you can, can use this to work out if you're moved into a, a different groundwater regime, you're sampling a different aquifer, that kind of thing. It's, a, it's an immediate result. pH, redox potential and or dissolved oxygen, uh, temperature and electrical conductivity, which is a relatively stable parameter. It requires um, some meters and electrodes, um, and knowledge of how to use them properly and to regularly calibrate these. The laboratory analysis methods, once we've collected our sa sample, we've stabilised our sample, we've um, collected a few in-field determinations and we've prepared our sample so that it can go off to the laboratory. We've got four field prep subsamples, um, a filtered and acidified sample for our metals, um, we're using iron chromatography for anions. Uh, I forgot to point out that we're using, it's been around for around about 20 years, the approach of using ICPAS and ICPMS for our metals, uh, the alkalinity titration for bicarbonate, and, uh, and our pre-concentration uh, technique for, for taking a one litre sample of, of water and concentrating any gold there onto a one gram carbon, uh, one gram sachet of activated carbon to allow us a, um, a significant improvement in our detection limit. The kind of um, uh, techniques that you'll, you'll request from your uh, lab, that they're available commercially. Uh, you will find that they, they do tend to cost a bit more than tradi traditional solid samples, uh, soils and stream sediments, and that's because uh, laboratories have a uh, have to change their workflow significantly to, to account for, for water samples. They're also dealing with um, much, much lower detection limits. It may or may not involve a clean lab, and uh, they have to spend a bit of time setting up and optimising their instruments. So uh, don't be shocked if you, you, you go through book prices and you compare uh, you know, a soil procedure to a groundwater procedure and notice that there is a, uh, a difference in price. It's, um, it's a bit more, but it's not, certainly not prohibitive. Simple interpretation options exist for you, and one of the easiest ones is, is just your standard thematic maps, uh, plotting up different elements. Um, high values, or certainly high relative values, uh, require some kind of explanation. Uh, hydrogeochemistry is more than, than just following the, the high results, but um, on that note, you should never really just discount an anomaly and, 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 and say it's, oh, well, a high zinc value could be a result of um, casing contamination from uh, galvanised piping, for example. You have to ask, you know, does that, does that number get any support from any other pathfinders? You can make thematic maps of things like pH, uh, which might highlight uh, oxidising sulphides, um, as might um, increased sulphate concentrations and even total dissolved solids, the salinity. 
Uh, another simple interpretation option is um, enrichment or depletion relative in major, um, in major elements, and in particular, they are referred to sulphate. Um, if we're getting a, a high relative sulphate with respect to uh, uh, the, the seawater sulphate to chloride ratio, it might indicate an area where we're getting oxidised sulphides. In particular, if you're also getting this um, accompanied by uh, depleted nitrate, it's, um, that's a good indication. It doesn't always work, but it's a relatively simple interpretation option which is available to you. Uh, furthermore, and I'd, I'd classify this as a relatively simple interpretation technique, is to look at um, simple multi-element indices which involve addition and subtraction of various elements. Um, this slide here shows a couple of um, just simple thematics for, for copper and, and moly taken from, the, uh, from Ernest Henry in, in Queensland. Um, we can see that uh, the actual mine scale is, is just down here and uh, it doesn't look like my, my pointer is, is transmitting to the screen, but uh, uh, the mine area at, at, at Ernest Henry, uh, it does, does show some potential uh, for using copper and moly. However, um, we notice that there are several samples in the mine area that, that don't have a pathfinder element response. Now, are these actually um, false negatives? Uh, were there sampling or sample preparation issues involved? Or was it the case that the groundwater just, just never, never got to where it needed to be? We can look at, uh, this is a map of, of sulphate enrichment uh, relative to the seawater uh, sulphate to chloride ratio and this will highlight areas where um, we're getting uh, a sulphate enrichment. Um, may or may not reflect um, oxidising sulphates um, and particularly if we compare this with uh, depleted uh, nitrate values, um, it, it can put you onto um, um, areas which you might want to want to follow up on. Uh, a multi-element lithology index, again this, this one comes from the work of uh, Gray and co-workers where um, just a simple additive and subtractive index has been put together to sort of highlight areas where uh, mafic and, and felsic lithologies can be, be mapped out um, using groundwater and this is, this is put on a, a gravity map from, from Geoscience Australia. So the, the mafic areas are shown in, in blue here and they, they correspond with the, the blue coloured dots quite well. More advanced data interpretation, um, as I was saying before, high concentrations, particularly in hydrogeochemistry um, work, are not necessarily better than smaller concentrations. We need to consider the pH, the redox potential, uh, the salinity of, of our samples. We need to, well, one option is to plot samples on uh, mineral stability diagrams. Um, we can look at groundwater equilibrium models and these can be used to estimate mineral saturation states and they can also be used as a predictive tool to uh, ask what if scenarios. It requires some familiarity with developing geochemical um, equilibrium models and using modelling codes. This example here shows gypsum solubility as a saturation index and it, it highlights samples which are saturated or, or very undersaturated and somewhere in between in terms of gypsum. Again, if we're having oxidising sulf sulphide bodies producing sulphate, um, they may come close to, to gypsum saturation. Uh, this diagram here is uh, I've, I've taken from, uh, from Angela Giblin and it shows samples plotted on an EHPH diagram and we can see that there are, there are in about four, four samples which plot uh, in EHPH space close to the, uh, the sphalerite stability field there. If that's taken a step further and, and added into a, uh, a groundwater model, um, it's a computerised model um, using uh, based around um, calculating the equilibrium state of that water, we can see that there's one sample which is plotting on that, uh, that tie line between the measured zinc concentration and the calculated zinc concentration. Uh, so this is quite a powerful tool uh, for, for working out whether your, your sample has, has come in contact with, um, with concealed mineralisation. Uh, as a ura quick uranium example here, these, these samples were taken from a mineralised paleo channel and we got really good agreement between uh, observed uranium concentrations and, and what we would calculate, what, what we would expect the groundwater to hold in terms of uranium. Um, and finally, uh, we can also look at uh, activity diagrams and, and we've got two examples here for um, iron oxide, copper, gold type deposits. Uh, the one on the left is from, from Tennant Creek, it was a regional scale sampling exercise and we can see that uh, those samples which are indicated in that uh, orange coloured ellipse there plot on that, that Muscovite K-Feldspar tie line on the, um, on the stability plot there. 
and they're all mineralized. They have a, a log um, silica activity of less than um, minus 3.5. Moving on to Olympic Dam, and, and the majority of those samples all have uh, log ex uh, silica activity less than, than 3.5. Last slide, sorry. In summary, think about how your hydrogeochemistry might add value to your project. You need to understand the process and, and where it might fail. Get your sample collection, field measurements, uh, sample preparation and, and lab analyses right. Sometimes you can get really good value from relatively simple interpretations, however, Big numbers in hydrogeochemistry are not necessarily better than small numbers. Water samples need to be considered uh, in their own particular context. Thank you. I've got some references there to Finance Key.